life was so much easier when we had overheads, wasn't it? We didn't have all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for the and invitation to come back to civilized part of the world. You live in Texas, you appreciate opportunities to come back to, uh, relative, yeah. to a place which has some, uh, some basic amenities and some civility, and it sure doesn't look like that outside in Texas. Um, uh, it, it's very encouraging that we're talking about repositioning. We started talking about that in 1990, and it's really encouraging now that it's become endemic in our field and people are recognizing the power of that concept. So I'm very delighted to have the opportunity to, uh, to get back into that a little bit this morning. Uh, uh, before I get launched into it, I should uh, say that in addition to tech teaching at Texas A&M University, some of us get a little dumber as we get older. And so for the last four years, I've been on the city council. And I've had an elected official role. And in that four years, uh, my city's 100,000 people. Our budget's $240 million. There are seven of us on the city council. We run all of us citywide. We do not have wards, so everybody gets to shout and holler at you. And in my, um, well, I was a deputy mayor last year, and I elected not to run for office in the last elections. But in my four years, I, um, uh, uh, we, we have a, 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 a a thousand uh, employees, you get zero remuneration as a council person. Uh, you get zero allowances. And in four years, I got zero expenses. Um, and you get a lot of hassle. And in Texas, it's a blood sport. I fought, I won three elections during that time. I survived a recall uh, petition from the Tea Party who tried to get me out on a recall ballot, and they failed. And they tried to get me fired from the university, and they tried, tried they failed there, and so on. But, but it gives you some real insights into political life, and so that has really informed some of my comments that I'm going to make about repositioning. So, um, so, so I push the button, and voila! Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go get my graduate students to get my overheads out again. <laughs> started in uh, 1960 and the, and the foundation paper was written by Theodore Levitt who was um, uh, and it appeared in the Harvard Business Review and the paper was called Marketing Myopia and Ted Levitt went on to be a um, uh, dean of the Harvard Business School and what Levitt talked about was his paper was called Marketing Myopia and he said nobody in business buys products or services nobody wants them they want what the products and services do for them. And he went through a whole series of exercises and said that if you focus on products and services, your vision is myopic. That is, it is narrow and short term. You don't see very far. And if you pursue focusing on products and services, you will die. And he went through a whole litany of corporations that died because they focused on products instead of what the products do for people. And so that's where I came into this, uh, uh, this field when my, when my training uh, uh, started in the field of marketing. And he said, the key question you ask is, what business are you in? And you answer it in benefit terms. So in 1974, I arrived in the United States, and at that time, the National Recreation and Parks Association uh, published the most important paper that ever appeared in the United States in this field. The paper was called Future Perspectives. It was written by David Gray and Cy Grieben. Uh, David was an academic from uh, California, and Cy was director of parks and recreation for the city of California. And in that paper, they had obviously listened to Ted Levitt. Now, David and Cy said, professional perspectives of parks and recreation are activity-centered. Definition in terms of activities is unsatisfactory. They went on to say, we should have discovered long ago the nature of the business we are in, but we have not. The critical questions are not how many were there, or who won. The critical question is, what happened to Jose, Mary, Sam, and Joan in this experience? What happened to them? And so this was the beginning of sort of an orientation towards marketing. I quickly learned that marketing, which, which, which as, as I understood it and had grown up with it, had a lousy public image because it was not understood correctly. And we gradually moved away from marketing and came up with a new term. And, and what brought it home for me was a, 
a, a phone call in the mid-80s from Bill Mott, and Bill, William Penn Watt was probably the most influential figure in the parks field in the United States in the latter half of the 20th century. And Bill Mott had just been appointed director of the National Park Service by Reagan. And, and Bill said, he said, I'm, I'm having a convocation of all of the uh, uh, senior people in the park service. I'm bringing 700 managers into the Tetons. And Crump said, I want you to get them excited about marketing, because the park service has got to get into marketing. But he said, there's one caveat. If you mention marketing once, they'll all switch off, because they're into saving the world. And marketing's about hard sell and telemarketing, and that has nothing to do with saving the world over here. And so I want you to get them excited about marketing. Don't you mention that word on time. So I went through all of my slides in those days, and I crossed out the word marketing, and I put in enhancing user satisfaction. And it was super. Everybody bought into enhancing user satisfaction, which in essence was what Levitt was talking about when we talk about marketing. And so we came up gradually getting away from that lousy word marketing to the term user benefits which is a much more explicit term and clearly communicates what we're doing in a much better way. So back in the late 70s, I'm talking about this, I'm one of the few people around in those days who has some understanding of marketing, and I get on, these are slides now which I, which I take from the 1970s, I would get on a public platform and I would say to an audience in this field, ladies and gentlemen, softball, back up Brian, softball is an asinine activity if you can find them. You stand there in the middle of a field. You've got a wooden stick in your hand. You swipe it as a ball. They make it a big ball so you can't miss it. It is an intrinsically trivial, stupid activity. And golf is worse. <laughs> you stand there with a stick in your hand and you swipe it at a ball. And you jump into your truck and you drive after it and you get out, and you hit it, and you drive after it, and you chase it down a little hole, and the whole thing is utterly ludicrous. I mean, I mean you, you have a Martian up there looking at this idiocy. I mean, I mean, I mean what is golf? Golf is a, um, a series of crises with an occasional miracle, and um, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the winner, the loser buys the drinks, and, the, and, and I mean, nothing about golf makes any sense. I was home in, in England not too long ago, and I was visiting with Alison Robertson, who's one of my good friends in the recreation business over there. And I said, one of the things I don't understand, understand about golf, Alice, is why are there 18 holes? Why aren't there 20 or 15? And he said, well, it's obvious. There's, there's 18 toddies in a whiskey bottle. Oh, well, of course, it makes all the sense in the world. <laughs> so anyway, um, why are these silly, trivial activities? No wonder people think we're unimportant. But of course the point is that those civil trivial activities are not important. It's what those activities do for people. They facilitate social interaction, they gain in prestige, social recognition, <coughs> excitement, ego satisfaction of achievement, security of part of a group, feeling of the bottom of importance, the bottom of the seventh, it all depends upon you. Uh, feeling of well-being, uh, aesthetic enhancement, challenge and risk, there's all kinds of benefits come out of that, and that really is the benefits we're in. But you know, most elected officials don't know that. Most of them still think we do these silly, trivial games, because we haven't told them about these kinds of benefits that come on out. I have some of my friends in Texas who waste their days sitting on reservoirs and they're sitting in a boat with a pole in the water. And I say, what are you doing? And they say, we're fishing. And I say, well, that doesn't make, as an economist, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, you, you, you spend eight hours in there hoping some sorry fish is going to impale itself on your hook, and you could go and be a consultant for somebody for a couple of hundred bucks and go to the fish mongers and buy a hundred fish. I mean, I don't understand why you would waste time on a reservoir fishing. Well, we know why people fish. To experience the outdoors, the pellet schools. I like this one best. To pick wits with the fish, which about sums up the whole sound of business. To be with friends, to share skills, mental change, to stay in present time. And for some people to get food. But that really isn't what fishing is about, is it? And yet, we focus, you know, in te Texas we have a, an outfit, the Texas Parks Department and Wildlife Department. But they employ biologists whose mission in life is to produce... Um, 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 bigger, dumber, blinder fish faster. 
And then say, well, why? I mean, it's the fish are important. It's the other stuff that's important. The point about this is that our activities meet basic human needs. And we haven't got that point across to many of the people who are outside our field. I first understood the business we were in when I went to work for Scott's Bakery. Scott's provided, I'm a, I'm a scouser from Liverpool, Scott's provided all the, um, the, the, the bread and the confectionery from the Liverpool conurbation. And I worked at Scott's as a teenager at the weekends and, at, uh, and on the night shift in the vacations sometimes. And, and when you, when you were, I, was, I was working on the bread lines. When you worked on the bread lines, like your starting job is you have a great big hod and you shove the loaves into the, into the ovens, these 10 foot square ovens, and you had a hod and you pulled them out and then the loaves went rattling down the belt. Now, and you worked in just a pair of shorts, it was hard as Hades up on, those, uh, up on those ovens. Now with time in Scots, you got promoted. The promotion in Scots wasn't about more money, it was about moving further away from the ovens. So I finished up as the Batman on the slicing machine. And, and that's where I met Colin Makin, who taught me about leisure. So, so on the back end of the slicing machine, these loaves come bouncing down the belt. I get them off the main belt, and I plug them onto a pallet, a 4 by 5 pallet, 20 loaves, and then on a, on a belt at right angles. And then I press a button, and they go down to Colin, the front man on the slicing machine, who zooms into action. Colin presses the button, which brings the blades down on the loaves. And then he presses another button, which takes them up again, and lifts the barrier, and they roll on down to the wrapping machine. So that's what Colin did every two or three minutes, depending on how long it took me to fill a pallet. Colin would go, Ch -ch. and he did that 46 hours a week in Scots, and he had the best job in the plant. But all the time he was doing it, he was jabbering on. He never quit talking, he was jabbering on. He's always jabbering on about, you know, uh, he's a fan of Liverpool Football Club and he stood on the cop and cheered for Liverpool and talked about last week's match from Sunday through Wednesday and next week's match from Wednesday through Saturday. And then he, he, he coached a team on Brookvale, a uh, youth soccer team, and they, they practiced on a Tuesday, Thursday night and he played a Sunday morning. And he was on his pub cribbage team and his pub darts team and he had a row house where he grew his flowers, especially his roses, and he was always jabbering on about these things. And one day it dawned on me. That's who Colin Bacon is. He is a football fan, a football coach, a, a cribbage player, a darts player, a rose grower. Only oh, happens to spend time in Scots. But that isn't how he defines himself. He defines himself with his leisure activities and these basic human needs, which many of us, ladies and gentlemen, are privileged to get in our work. For many people in our society, they don't. If you're pushing that button in Scots, it's just to get prestige and adrenaline rush, ego satisfaction and achievement, part of the group, being important. That's tough when you're in those kinds of positions. And so we look at one of the fastest growing jobs in the United States of America, and these are the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And here they are from 2008 to 2018, the jobs which will have most people, new jobs created. And you can see, and I want to draw your attention to the last column on your right, where you see the salary, which is described as very high, very low, low or very low. And the salaries at the bottom there, very high is over 50,000, and very low is under 22,000. As you go down those columns on the right, you see lots of very low, low, very low, very low, very low, low, very high, low, very high, low. You see that the majority of new jobs produced in the United States economy are bottom of the line service kinds of jobs, reflecting the way the economy is going. And so, for many, many Americans, and I assume Canadians also, an increasing number of them will get those basic human needs we have just identified in their leisure milieu or they will not get them at all. They will not get them in their work milieu. And so if we meet basic human needs, not leisure needs, but basic fundamental human needs in what we do. And so that's, I don't want to lose track of that. Users are always going to be important to what we do. They are our primary advocates, there are inventory and lobbying and referendums. As a council member, if I can get one-tenth of one percent 
of the population of College Station in the council chamber to shout and scream about recreation, we will win. There's one tenth of one percent, it's a hundred people. If I get 100 people in the council chamber harassing the council, I don't care how many fancy papers there are out there and how many logical arguments there are, they will win. You know, that's what it takes in the council chamber. That's the reality of my world, my political world. And so I don't need many, but those users have got to be my advocates and inventory, so they're always going to be important. People don't use our services unless I can value them. They don't value them unless I can support them. And so my position is, I'm going to move on from users to say that users, satisfied users, are a necessary, but I'm going to argue they're not a sufficient constituency for us. So by the sort of 1990s, we've got agencies understanding user benefits, focusing on user benefits, and so on. And so we go to our decision makers, elected officials, and, and we pull on them and we say, no, well, we're terribly important, we're doing all this good work, and, and we don't get a terribly positive response. <laughs> so, well, why not? We, we're, we're doing good work to people who, who need it. Why aren't we getting this response? And I, I go back to my, um, my Paul Sanders on the public private goods model, and I look at user benefits on the right, the question of who benefits, the answer is individuals who participate. So then I look at the next logical question, which says, well, who pays? If the individual who participates gets all the benefits, then clearly that individual should pay the full cost. <laughs> But then I stopped and said, but, but we are tax subsidized. It isn't funded by user fees, it's funded by taxes. And so if I look at the left hand side here, when I look at who pays the community through the tax system, no user charges, and I go up and say, well, therefore who should benefit? The answer is a large proportion of people in the community. I guess in a democracy, 51% or more. And, and so they should be community wide benefits if I'm going to have tax support. And so we were adopting what I call a line of, we had what I call a line of incongruity. We had tax resources being put in, but we were talking about user benefits. And yet, and, and, and we should have been talking, if we were to use tax support resources, community benefits. And so it's gradually dawning on Crompton that user satisfaction, user benefits, is an inadequate measure of our success. Why? Because most taxpayers are not users of most of our services. So you have to ask the question, why should they support them? I mean, we've, in my town, I've got 500 kids in Little League. So I've got probably 1% of families in the community in Little League. So the question is, we, we subsidize each Little League player to the tune of about $400 when you look at the bills for funding Little League. So the question is, why should the other 99% of taxpayers support 500 kids playing Little League? That's the question that we, have to, we had to address. So gradually dawning on Crompton that it isn't the on-site benefits that users get from participating that are major importance. As I said, they're a necessary condition. But it's the off-site benefits that accrue to people who don't use those facilities that are important. So the challenge for you, ladies and gentlemen, is right there. Bert and Ethel aren't going to your ice rink, and they're not going to your recreation center. But you need their vote. And so the question is, why should they vote for you? What's in it for Bert and Ethel to support your tax claims for these silly, trivial games? Well, the field sine qua non, its purpose, if you like, is it performs a necessary service for the community beyond responding to the demands of particular user groups. We have to go further in the terms of some other speaker up here earlier in this conference. We're in a pup tent and we need a big tent to bring all of these people into to win the coming battles. And so it gradually dawns on Crompton, we should be focusing not on user benefits. We need those, and yes, we focus on, but on community-wide benefits. So back in 1990, one of my friends in England, a lady called Sue Glyptus at Loughborough, wrote a nice little book on leisure and unemployment. And I had one of those aha movements reading Sue's book. She said the provision of leisure for its own sake still lacks political clout, has to show other more tangible returns, such as jobs, urban regeneration, alleviated delinquency, or whatever, to be worth funny. On its own, it's too flippant. On its own, it sounds, it carries real political conviction, only if advocated for other instrumental reasons to it. I said, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. 
We have to demonstrate to the community we have a broader purpose than just servicing users. And so my question to you is, what do you see? Are you watching a youth soccer game? Or are what you're seeing kids getting social recognition, excitement, ego satisfaction, achievements, going about, what are you talking about to those parents? Are you talking about the silliness of a soccer game running up and down a field? Or are you talking about the kinds of benefits that come out? So look again. Are you talking beyond those user benefits and saying, this isn't about kids running up and down into a, a, a field playing football, it's about reducing healthcare costs. It's about alleviating juvenile crime. It's about community cohesion. It's about economic development and tournaments coming to town. It's about, now we're talking about community-wide benefits. And so it's about taking it beyond the activity, beyond the user benefits, to the, the community-wide benefits, which leads me to the notion of repositioning. So the current position that we have in most people's minds is that we are to be a relatively discretionary, non-essential government service. We're nice to have if it can be affordable. What repositioning means is that we want to put our services so they are perceived to be a central contribution to alleviating the major problems in a community identified by taxpayers and decision makers. Now many people have talked about we want to be a core service rather than a fringe service. What that means to be a core service is you have to alleviate the major problems in a community because that's where tax, tax dollars go. That's what repositioning is about. What on earth is that doing there? Oh, okay. Um, uh, back up again. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm missing one or two slides. That's okay. We can get for me to be here. So uh, let's go back to our roots and look at how we were, how we originally became a tax-supported service. And we go back, back up one piece, right? So we go, oops, go forward. Okay. Now, if you look at the park side of the equation, the reason we became a public service is a tax supported service is we, because we solved a public health problem. And let me identify that problem for you. The first urban park in the world was built, purpose built urban park, rather than inherited royal park or something, uh, was built in, uh, by John Nash and he created Regent's Park in London, uh, uh, started it in 1912, sorry, 1812, and it took about 20 years to finish. But here's Nash's principle. I was in Regent's Park two or three weeks ago with their, with their team and, and rooted through their archives and so on. And here's what I found on Nash's downs. Nash established the central principle of his plan. The attraction of open space, free air, and scenery of nature with the means of invitation of exercise on horseback, on foot, and in carriages shall be preserved in Merrymore Park, which is what it was called before it became Regent's Park, as a moment to motives for the wealthy part of the public to establish themselves. So he put open space up there in the center of this real estate development. And here you have Regent's Park, and, and you see in the center there an open park area, one of the world's great parks, a beautiful park. And around the edge, you see those black spots are all the famous Nash terraces. And there are 2,500 of those. And these aren't cheap, tatty terraced houses. <laughs> these are where the elite nobility located. And so, the question is, why did they locate there? And it has to do with the state of the cities back in, uh, back in that era. And here are the, the population growth of these cities. So you take Liverpool in 1801, 82,000, 1831, 202,000, 1851, 376,000. I mean, the rates of growth you know, just boggle the imagination on these cities. And, and the people poured into these cities. And these cities, uh, they had no amenities. They had, um, you know, they were jerry-built houses. They had no sewers, they had no drains, they had no streets, they had no, no planning, they had nothing. And yet, with all these needs that they had, these, uh, these people, these sinners, these council persons, made this absolutely bizarre decision to spend millions of dollars on parks. I mean, in that context, that is bizarre. Nobody had ever done this before. We saw 
parks. I mean, with all of these real problems, which, which, which uh, alongside those, today's problems pale, how, how on earth did they make that decision? Well, the answers really come out of, out of Edwin Chadwick's report of 1842 on the condition of the lake. And what Chadwick identified, and he was just articulating in his 400-page report what others already knew, was the pervasive filth in the cities. All the industrial factories and so on spewed out their stuff. Every trade and tile work and jam factory and cement works and chemical works and glue factories. And, and they all spewed out their stuff. And of course the people lived right around these places because there was no transportation to get in out of the cities. They had to live where they worked. And they crammed them in 200 to 300 of the acre right next to these factories in all of this filth and smell going on around the place. And there was filth on the streets. Remember we've got horses pushing, pulling everywhere, with horse dung everywhere, to, and all the smells and odors that come from that that's going on. And then we have residential filth. How did people uh, get rid of their excretia and urine and water? They tucked it in cesspools which were emptied, mainly overflowed, it poured into the streets, they emptied chamber pots in the streets. If you read the reports of those times, there was enormous filth and smells that came on, the filthy and disgraceful state of these streets, uh, in Manchester, which we're talking about here, he says, and this is the, uh, Dr. K, the chief physician in Manchester, no fact is better established that a large proportion of the causes of fever which occur in Manchester originate from this filth. And so, what we had in, in, in the English cities, you also got in the American US cities, in New York City you had exactly the same conditions, and it's no accident, incidentally, the major park systems came out of Liverpool and Manchester and New York City and Baltimore and Philadelphia and Boston, where all of this filth was congregated. And so they had, and the, the problem, the issue here was the filth was perceived to be the source of disease. The filth created what were known as miasmas, obnoxious, nasty smells. And people believed that the main causes, and this is uh, from, um, from Edwin Chadwick's report, the main cause of the ravages of epidemic, endemic, and contagious diseases among the community is these smells, these miasmas. We didn't have germ theory. It didn't come along until 1880s, 1890s, and the conventional wisdom believed in miasmas all the way through up to the First World War. So, so we had a vegetable and animal litter. This is Thomas Southwood Smith, who was the uh, British uh, head medical officer for the United Kingdom in those days. He said, vegetable and animal matter during the process of beautification give off a principle or give origin to a compound which when applied to the human body produces a phenomenon constituting fever. In other words, the miasmas cause fevers. They were responsible for everything from a cold to the cholera, typhoid, scar, epidemics that came on through. So, so the issue was these smells. Keep going. I'm going to skip those for a moment. Um, and and the and, and how and Joseph Priestley had done his uh, experiments. Uh, you remember he had a candle in there, and the candle went out when you put it in the jar. When you put some vegetation in the jar, the candle stayed lit. So we knew that vegetation gave up oxygen. Oxygen, vegetation cleaned the air. Now we're getting to parks. Oxygen cleaned the air. And so if you lived close to a park, you got clean air from oxygen that came out. And the oxygen fought the, fought the bad airs of miasmas. So if you were wealthy, you tried to live next to these big parks because you lived longer. You didn't get caught up in the epidemics. And also the cost of these epidemics was enormous because the people who were wiped out, the head of families were wiped out, leaving six orphans and a widow behind, they, they had to be paid for through the poor laws, and it was all about the costs of these looking after these orphans and so on. We got into parks because they solved a medical problem. That's why we had urban parks. And so here we have a um, report to the Sanitary Commission of Massachusetts. In 1850, following uh, Edwin Clark's, uh, Edwin uh, Chadwick's model, a clear recommendation by the engineers and the, and the folks, sanitation. We recommend that open spaces be reserved in cities and villages in Massachusetts for public walks. That's their name for parks in those days. That wide streets be laid out and that both be ornamented with trees. Such an arrangement would have a good effect upon the beauty and social jobs of the place, but it would have a greater effect upon its general sanitary condition. 
Parks were about creating sanitary conditions and oxygenating uh, the, the area. Walt Whitman, who was um, one of the most, most famous authors in the United States, in, in his days as editor of the Brooklyn Eagle, he said, um, the sanitary, he pointed the embrace of parks to public health. He said, the sanitary influence of the city of a plentiful open grounds, parks for disease, was the basic rationale for putting, um, putting dollars into urban parks from the get-go. So this is William Farr, who was the chief um, uh, registrar in the United Kingdom, in his first annual report to, to the British Parliament saying, wide streets, squares and parks with spacious houses would render ventilation easy, secure the illusion of poisonous emanations, that's the miasmus. And, and he goes on to say, a good general system of sewers and a park in the east end of London would probably diminish annual deaths by thousands, prevent many years of sickness and add several years to the lives of the entire population. Now, if that's what parks do for you, you have a case for tax support. And it isn't us saying that. This is the guy who looks after the, uh, the births and deaths uh, thing, arguing for parks to reduce death rates. So in New York City, uh, John Griscom, who is the chief medical officer in New York City in 1845, produces a report just like Edwin Chapman. He models it on Chapman and makes the same case for parks as an anti-miasmus thing in New York City. And he writes, and necessary, this is one of his, uh, 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 and then uh, Griscom goes on to help form the Medi American Medical Association. The American Medical Association in, in 1849 come out with their first report about the health of the cities, written by the 13 uh, chief uh, medical officers in the 13 largest cities in the US. Back up one, please. And so, and so that report says the necessity of public squares, tastefully ornamented and planted with trees, cannot be too strongly urged on public attention as one of the most powerful correctives to the vitiated air within the reach of inhabitants of a populous place. Again, arguing for parks to fight disease. Lemuel Shattuck in Massachusetts, in his report, again following Chadwick's lead, as a recommendation in that report states, we recommend, this is the engineers responsible for fixing uh, sewers and, and, and the health people, we recommend that open spaces be reserved in cities and parks uh, for public walks, that wide streets be laid out, that both be ornamented with trees, uh, such an arrangement have a good effect upon the beauty and social enjoyments of the place, but it would have a greater effect on the general sanitary conditions. Uh, Skip Whitman, carry on, we talked about him. And so we had them arrived at this powerful image as parks, as lungs of the city. In all of this filth, you have this, these oxygen generating lungs that pumped out clean air. The lungs is the metaphor first came in with William Pitt the Elder uh, back in the late 1700s. It was used in a, a debate in Parliament in 1808 when they were trying to pave over Hyde Park and, and people protested. It's the lungs of London. We knew all about oxygenation in those days. And so we moved on to, uh, to several uh, uh, other private parks in England where the wealthy built around them in the cities. But finally we got to the first world's first public park. The world's first public park was Birkenhead Park, just across the Mersey from Liverpool. They started, wait a minute, Brian, back up. So they, they started in Birkenhead Park, um, uh, they started a new city in Birkenhead Park. The first thing they did was to build a park before they built any houses. They built the park in there. And, and for the wealthy merchants of Liverpool to come over and position themselves around the park. And of course, you see these lots around the park just like uh, you saw around uh, a Regent's Park. And they flogged off the lots in order to pay for the park. And the park was actually a profitable venture. When you do the bottom line in current dollars at the bottom there, the surplus was about £7 million in today's dollars. Parks made a profit because the wealthy wanted to locate around them because they, they saved their lives and they contributed to the health of the community. And so this gentleman comes across England in 1850, Frederick Law Olmsted gets off the ship in Liverpool on his, on his walk around England and he says, he goes to Birkenhead Park and he says in his diary, I saw a perfection I had never dreamed of. I cannot undertake to describe the effect of so much taste and skill as has evidently been employed. All this magnificent pleasure ground entirely and reservedly forever the people's own, but to require who pay for it, why the honest owners? Those wise and worthy people of Birkenhead with tax money, in the same way that New Yorkers pay for the tombs, which is their prison. 
and the hospital and the cleaning, as they amusingly say, of their streets. In other words, he's in awe of what he's seeing over there, and he goes back and copies it and does a New York Central Park. Remember, Olmsted then went on to be head of the U.S. Sanitation Committee in the, in the Civil War, had under his control, which of course Sanitation Committee was the forerunner of the Red Cross, uh, had under his control dozens of doctors that he sent around, physicians he sent around the camps to improve the hygienic conditions. He knew all about miasmas from his physicians. And all the way through Olmsted's writing, he makes the case for urban parks across America as fighters of disease and miasmas. So there's our basis, that's our reason for being as a tax-supported service, was we offered a healthy uh, solution to health problems in the community. The phrase, pay now, pay later, is all the way through this literature. Invest in parks and sewers now, save lots of money down the road. Exactly the same thing that we're hearing today, 150 years later. What about the recreation side of the house? Right back there. So we're in, we've got money for public recreation for one reason only, if you look at the literature of the 1890s and 1900s, it was to alleviate juvenile crime among young males. To encourage civility and civic responsibility is why tax money went into public recreation. I love some of those early quotes. This is the Chicago Tribune of 1912. Recreation is the antitoxin of delinquency. And the sooner it is administered, the milder will be the disease, and the better it will be for all children. Uh, the Juvenile Protection Association. So of course we're going to put it in because it saves us money. I love this picture. The caption is, all these children were arrested in a single day for playing in the street. Will you help provide playgrounds? Which of course were the pluralist of public recreation. And so we got in because we solved a juvenile crime problem. William Taft, the President of the United States, right, the Playground Association of America. I do not know anything which will contribute more to the strength and morality of that generation of boys and girls compelled to remain part of urban populations in this country than the institution in their cities of playgrounds. I mean, that's why we got public recreation, because we solved a problem in the city. We solved a problem. There's some lessons to be learned from these early days. And I've been rummaging around the libraries now in these early things for some time. Firstly, conceptual alignment is the key. Elected officials do not, and did not in those days, and do not need to see the empirical data. They don't read that anyway. What they need is there to be a conceptual nexus, and we have that in our field. Clearly, intuitively, health and recreation go together. So alleviated crime and recreation go together. You know, climate change and recreation parks go to and the, the link is intuitive. That is a major advantage we have over many other fields where that link is not so intuitive. And so it's about and that's how you make bridges to elected officials. You make them conceptually, not empirically. And that's very clear from this early literature. It was all about conceptual linkages. There was tactical use of science to support advocacy. Let me now differentiate my academic life where integrity of empirical, empirical findings is essential to my political life, where one makes progress by cherry-picking the scientific findings to get from A to B. <laughs> and so what you see in those early reports is clear cherry-picking. They put, Chadwin had a testimony from people who supported his view of the world, and the rest didn't get a look at. I have learned on the city council there are four words which win me every argument, and those are, the research shows that, and I got some stuff, and they ain't. Now, in my council role, very bluntly, I'm cherry picking. I'm not telling them the whole story. I'm not telling them if they don't agree with my, my story. You know, now, academically, I have to, but in my council role, it's a different deal. And that's how politicians work. We have a constituency and a preordained view of the world, and darn it, we're going to pick up any facts that get us from A to B. And, and uh, you might say, well, that's immoral and unethical and whatever. I'm just telling you that that's the reality of the political world that I live in. Um, powerfully in those early studies, there was a terrific link to the medical community. It, who led the, the parks movements in New York City? John Griscom, chief medical officer. 
In Chicago, John Rausch, a, a president of the American Medical Association. In, um, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, it was Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was the most influential. He spoke eloquently about parks and the way they would reduce disease in the city of Boston. He was educated in France with the Center of Medicine in those days. Marvelous speaker and so on. The medical fraternity led the charge for parks and recreation in America. So, so what's the lesson for us today? Every time you do these studies about, and this is a, a poll by a Gallup, uh, which they do every year, who are the most respected professionals in America, the United States today? Same results every year. Number one, nurses. Number two, druggists and pharmacists. Number three, medical doctors. Always come out as the most revered figures. They have to speak for us. They have to be our spokesperson if we're going to move into the health arena. As somebody said yesterday, it's not us speaking, it's getting them speaking for us. And I have a friend in England, William Bird, who's a general practitioner, who's into the kind of stuff that uh, Mr. Louvre has popularized, the, the sort of uh, um, impact on, uh, on mental health of vegetation, which Roger Ulrich uh, um, pioneered and then Min Kyo has picked up more recently and so on. Uh, and he's, he's taken that on as a hobby and has had massive influence in the medical community because he's a physician. I can talk about it all day long, but I'm not one of them. I'm not a physician. And so our moral here is we do need the medical fraternity involved. And of course we need influential champions. We need some people who will pick up on, who will pick up on things and lead the charge for us. And, and that's what, if you go around cities today, there are some, uh, some um, cities have excellent parks and recreation departments and some don't. And the reason is that some had champions and some didn't. It's that simple. So, uh, David Gray and Cy Grieben, back in that classic paper, made this observation. We're not identified with the major problems which confront our total American society, which is a deep concern and disappointment. The field should focus park recreation services. The great social problems of our time develop programs designed to contribute to the amelioration of those problems. That's where we are today. I mean, that's saying that in 74. We're getting to that point now, identifying with the major problems in the community, which is what repositioning is about. The big idea of repositioning is that funds are, here's the phrase, invested in solutions <coughs> to a community's most pressing problem. Term investing is a positive, forward-looking agenda with a return on the investment. I, as an elected official, have no mandate to fund programs. My mandate is to invest resources into solutions. So, let me finish then with a few observations about positioning. It's a relative, not an absolute concept. In other words, you have all done studies in your communities about your image. And people think you're wonderful, you're terrific, and 95% you're excellent or very good, and whatever, and your budget gets cut. How can that be? Well, you might be terrific, but the problem is, in their eyes, you're not very important. So if I look at the 300 largest cities in America and where the money goes, the prime most important service is education, and then health and hospitals, and then police, and then welfare, and public works, and transportation, and fire, and housing community development, and economic development, and tourism, and parks and recreation. Thank the good Lord for arts and libraries. And so, so you can be as terrific as you like down here, but if you're not important, you don't get any money. And what positioning does is aligns you with something that's important, and that's how you get money. Legislators' political platforms represent citizens' concerns. As a legislature, I am, I, am, I am not going to fund parks and recreation. I have no mandate to fund parks and recreation agencies. A mandate to solve problems. I was elected on a platform with my constituents, and I promised them I was going to do these things and address these issues which were of concern, and they elected me on the basis of that promise. Now, in parks and recreation, if you help me solve that problem that I was elected on, I will give you dollars. But if you don't, if you're doing your thing over here and it isn't what I was elected on, I'm not going to give dollars to you. I mean, that's not my contract with the people. I mandated to solve those problems. You have to ally with those problems if you want resources. That's the, the political reality, and in my view, that's the way democracy is supposed to work. So the challenge isn't financial. In my situation, if ever I said I'm going to raise taxes to give more money to whatever recreation project it was, I'm done tomorrow. I'm out of office. I'm gone. I'm history. <laughs> you know, in my world, you don't raise taxes. So it's all about 
making the case that you can address the issue better than somebody else in order for you to get resources. That's the key. Um, Rice and Trout were the pioneers of this. I've got that two more slides. Okay. Rice and Trout were the pioneers of this thing. And, uh, back up. Uh, and, and they said, they reminded us about the importance of our roots. They said, working out an identity program, which in their terms, in our terms, is position, for a corporation, which is where most of their work has been, usually entails a retasting of steps until you discover the basic business of a company, and this requires pouring over old plans and programs, seeing what worked and what didn't. And I've just taken you through that, what worked in recreation, what worked in parks, and getting back to our roots, cues us as to what the most powerful positions are likely to be. It leads to this conclusion. If you adopt a position in your community and you align with some things and, and you need to adopt no more than two positions. If you say you're going to do ten things, you become a snake oil salesman. I do this, 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 and position is all about focus, focus, focus. It's about focusing on the issues. And if you do that, it means that by definition, a number of the other things you do will be discretionary. And one has to accept that. So it isn't about all parks and recreation activities being core activities. It's about recognizing those, as many of them as we can, align with the problems. But if some don't, they're discretionary. And, and that's okay. That's okay. But we have to accept that reality. And that's, I'm never going to do that in 10 seconds. So we'll finish it there, Brian. Thank you. <laughs>